we were trying to think about what we could do to help celebrate Canada's 150th anniversary of Confederation. And initially we thought of different types of youth projects. We could take a group of Canadian youth to the Arctic, but we kind of already did that. Um, but one day, right here uh, in our office, we were looking at the map of Canada and realizing that we do have the largest coastline of any country in the world, that we are an ocean nation, and that that ocean and that coastline connects the country. So the idea of a journey, a ship-based journey, coast to coast to coast, and, and in some ways to coast, if the fourth coastline, the Great Lakes, was born. Um, and on the back of a napkin, kind of sketched out what that journey would look like. And it came to 148 days. So we rounded it up to 150 and a, a project was born. When Jeff um, had this great idea about a Canada 150 project and getting an icebreaker to go all the way around Canada from Toronto to Vancouver in 150 days, he reached out to the museum to see if uh, we wanted to get involved in that project, and of course we did. Um, one of the elements of that, uh, of all the Canada 150 projects, was about the environment. And when we think about the environment, we think about documenting natural history from all over this country. And it's so rare to have an opportunity uh, for a research platform, like an icebreaker, to be going around the entire coast of the country. And so that became uh, an amazing opportunity for us to get our experts and some of our colleagues at the other museums in Canada to take part in, in this expedition. So on the Canada C3 ship, the Polar Prince, we had two science labs. The first one was in the bow of the ship, which used to be uh, a workshop for the sailors. And then we also had this container lab, which is a shipping container, converted into a science lab that we got from Dalhousie University. And so we kind of divided the, the projects into these two labs. Those DNA projects that required a cleaner space went into the container lab, which was a very nice, pristine lab. Whereas the lab in the old workshop was a bit more dirty, a little bit more rough and tumble. So that's where we did things like process dirty like plant samples um, and put invertebrates into jars and various things like this. So our, our scientific goals from, from the museum's point of view, our projects were really to record the natural history encountered by this voyage. And specifically, we were recording terrestrial plants, which fit in nicely to our, uh, our flora of the Arctic and the Arctic Islands project that's ongoing. Uh, and also, we were recording uh, uh, the diversity of invertebrates in the, in the ocean, where we're looking at terrestrial plants, but Paul Hamilton uh, was also uh, collecting um, microscopic algae in the ocean, but also in freshwater, things, uh, standing pools and, and rivers and, and streams that we, we saw on the shore as well. So we had all of these projects that we were doing to, to really record the natural history of Canada all along its, its coastlines. Um, this, is, this is one of the few voyages that actually allowed scientists to collect data from all across the country. Um, a lot of the times when you go out, you go out to a very specific area and you collect, you know, this area or this area because field work doesn't allow you to go and spend 150 days going all across the country. So this is one of the few opportunities that allowed a project to go all the way from Toronto to Vancouver and be continuous along the way and collect samples that entire route along the way. Um, and for things like botany, especially Arctic plants, or for water quality or microplastics, that's the type of thing that you want that continuity and you want to see the variation between the East Coast or the Arctic or you know different parts of, of our coastline. Durant l'expédition, euh, à ce niveau-là, au niveau du lac 2, nous avons échantillonné l'ADN environnemental qui est présent dans l'eau. Et ça, ça nous donne une idée des espèces sauvages, incluant les espèces envahissantes, qui peuvent être présentes parce que toutes les espèces relâchent des fragments d'ADN de leur génome. Et donc, en prélevant cette eau-là, on est capable d'identifier des espèces et de confirmer la présence simplement en filtrant l'eau 
et en regardant l'ADN qui s'y trouve. C'est assez extraordinaire comme méthode, c'est très poussé. On a aussi échantillonné les microplastiques, qui est un problème mondial. Donc, un des thèmes, c'était de voir quelle est la qualité de l'environnement aussi, d'une côte à l'autre de ces trois océans du Canada. So this DNA work will help us to capture uh, the diversity in new ways in the future because we're going to be doing environmental DNA in the future. Just grab a water sample. From the water sample, we're going to try and identify everything that's there. Well, we're not there yet, but the kind of work we're doing today will build up the library that we'll be able to use to do the identifications. So this, this information will all go to the different scientists in Canada and colleagues around the world as well. And they will um, look at this data, analyze it, make publications, and then this gets added to all the knowledge that we know about the ocean and the terrestrial environment in the Arctic. I led the Arctic Plant and Lichen Biodiversity Research Project, coordinated that for the whole trip, and on Lake 10 I was involved in the research, so the goal of the project was to document plant and lichen diversity by making natural history collections. Arctic vegetation is changing rapidly in response to the warming climate. Shrubs on the tundra are getting bigger, they're getting denser, and there's potential that those shrub changes could change uh, the diversity of other species on the landscape. So by documenting what occurs in different areas now, we have a baseline that we can look back to in the future and understand if any changes potentially happened. As with most of the scientists who joined the Canada C3 expedition, I got to participate in all of the various scientific projects that took place during the trip. Uh, of course though, because my background is in Arctic botany, that was the one I really focused on while I was on the trip. And uh, actually, I think what I really tried to make the most of was collecting lichens in particular of the Western Canadian Arctic, just because they're somewhat undercollected, and even in September when we were there, the lichens are still vivid, bright, and interesting. The days were very full. We were busy from early in the morning till late at night with science and with many other activities as well. And really every single day was full of highlights. It's pretty much impossible to choose just one. The fact that we had participants who do not have a biological or scientific background meant that there were opportunities to share um, what we were finding out in the field with people who may not have seen this before. So it was an excellent opportunity to go out with other participants and look at this biodiversity and explore nature together. One of the participants on the cruise, his name was Tony, and he was legally blind, so he had his guide dog with him. And it was absolutely amazing watching him negotiate all the dangers and perils of being on a ship at, at sea. Uh, it was incredible to see him negotiate steep stairs and get on the zodiacs and get out of the zodiacs the seas are rocking and yet he just took it all and just went ahead and it was absolutely amazing to watch him do that so that was really powerful for me a place called hatch island it's off of uh, frobisher bay it's not a very big island it's very tall and it's it's uninhabited by humans and there's tens of thousands of seabirds that nest there. Thick-billed myrrhs, uh, black-legged kittiwakes. There were just birds all around us and it was just magical, it was just lovely. And in the middle of all that, we circled the island and then we did some sampling a couple of kilometers away. And in doing our CTD, our conductivity temperature depth readings, we, we shot the sensor down into this lovely, clear, blue ocean water. And it was just lovely. The biodiversity is still extraordinary, that we find entre Montréal and Trois-Rivières, entre Trois-Rivières and Quebec. There are des oiseaux marins, there are cormorants, there are poissons, there are l'esturgeon. La vie is extraordinaire encore. C'est pas euh, uniquement pollué, là. Les Grands Lacs sont encore avec plein d'espèces fascinantes. Et j'étais avec euh, des biologistes qui, qui partageaient le voyage. J'ai appris beaucoup de ces gens-là. La faune ichthyologique, la faune avienne, la faune du Benta, c'est encore extraordinaire et vaut la peine d'être protégé. Donc ça, ça me, ça me réveillait 
par rapport à cet aspect-là, la biodiversité est encore existante. Elle est belle. There, there are many highlights of this trip for me. Um, one that I particularly remember was being on the Science Zodiac. We were out on the West Coast, um, out in BC, and it was the moment of taking the very last science sample out in the Science Zodiac. And uh, it felt like a happy moment, but also a sad moment for everyone on board. And we called up to the big ship and let them know the science program was a wrap. It was a, a bittersweet experience for sure. I mean, really, it was the end of five months of science. Um, but in some ways, I mean, it was just the start of it as well, because what we'd been doing on the ship was collecting samples. Um, but now all the analysis had to start, and the analysis still continues. It was celebrating this place we call Canada after 150 years. Um, it, was, uh, it was engaging people who have been part of Canada and their cultures have been part of Canada for way more than 150 years. Uh, and so it engaged all Canadians in many different cultures. And so either whether they're on the ship or through um, our transmissions online, so it, it, or showing up in communities, it was a massive success. Of course, Canadian Heritage was the main supporter uh, as a signature project for, for uh, Canada 150, but other government departments, uh, Environment Canada, Parks Canada, the Canadian Wildlife Service, uh, uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, the list is long, Canadian Ice Service, um, but philanthropists that believed in what we were doing and they wanted to help out. Um, small little businesses, big corporations in, in the country. Um, it, was, uh, it was really what made it successful. And of course, the Canadian Museum of Nature was right there at the, the ground floor and we couldn't have got it off the ground without them. So uh, it, it's, it's a testament to this country, I think, that I don't know if a, Can a Canada C3 could have happened in any other country. Thank you.